One of the things you can be virtually certain of in life is that you don't get something you don't aim at. And one of the things that's interesting about that is often people will keep their goals fuzzy. Because one of the problems with specifying your goals is you specify your failures. Right, if the goal is really fuzzy, you're not sure when you fail, and that then you can fool yourself. You know, really, but you can kind of keep it foggy. But you make your goal sharp and clear. Then, well, first of all, then you know what to aim at. And what's interesting is, you know, your brain is set up so that it reorganizes the world around your aims. And that's not, I've also written about this in 12 Rules for Life quite extensively, and that's not a metaphor. Like, we don't see much of the world because there's a lot of the world and there isn't much of us. And so we see what we aim at, we aim with our eyes. And here's an example. So like great apes don't really have much of a white in their eyes, but human beings do. And the reason for that is that we've evolved to detect where everyone else is looking. And so if I can't tell where you're looking, I don't know what you're up to. And then, well, over time, that means I can't read you as well and we're more likely to get in a dispute and one or the other of us is more likely to get killed. But it also means that your, your probability of finding a successful mate decreases. So we've evolved to have this very, very visually evident eye. And so when we're looking at each other, we're always looking at our, at the, our eyes because then we can tell where someone is pointed and then we can tell what they're up to. And so we're hunting creatures, like we're aiming at a moving target and trying to track it all the time. And so you have to specify your aim. And it's more than one aim. It's like you have a highest aim, which you might say is to be a good person. And then I would say, well, there's a, there's a more elaborated aim than that. It's like you want to be able to constrain malevolence and work to decrease suffering. It's something like that. That's the highest aim. And, and then and then you have to decompose that into the things you do each day so that there's a definite connection between all the micro actions and the macro aim and then that gives dignity to what you're doing why have a goal well it's easy no goal no positive emotion because you experience positive emotion by noticing that you're moving towards a goal and so if you don't have a, have a goal well you can't have any positive emotion so you better have a goal and so you might say, well, what should the goal be? Well, we could start by saying, well, any goal is better than none. And then we might say, well, it should be a goal that other people will let you pursue because otherwise it's going to be kind of difficult. And maybe they'll be even happy to help you pursue it. That would even be better. And maybe it's a goal that would enable you to learn how to pursue other goals while you pursue that goal. Boy, that would really be good. And so you can see that your goal is parameterized but that doesn't mean that any old goal works. It means there's some goals that work nicely and some not so nicely. There are playable games and non-playable games. That's a good way of thinking about it. And you want to have a playable game. And there's a lot of them, lawyer, plumber, you know, actor, whatever. They're, they're playable games. And, and it's not obvious which one's better, but it's certainly obvious which ones are sustainable and which ones are worse. And so there's a set of playable games and you need to extract from that set of playable games a game that suits you. Enthusiasm and joy, happiness, let's say, is 100% depend dependent, as far as we can tell, on observations that you're progressing towards a valued goal. It's not attainment focused, that's satiation. You get something you want, and you're satisfied about it. That's a whole different neurochemical system. But enthusiasm and joy that people associate with happiness manifests itself when you're moving towards a valued goal. So if you don't prioritize your goals because you don't exist within a structure of value, then you have no positive emotion. And positive emotion is half of forward moving motivation. Well, in fact, in terms of forward movement, it's almost all the motivation because the embodied manifestation of positive emotion is the movement towards a valued goal. That's what it is. That's why you have the positive emotion. Because you are a creature that can move towards goals. And the emotional signaling of that is positive emotion. No goal, no positive emotion. No hierarchy of goals, dilution or eradication of positive emotion. Because if you're confused enough, and you have a hundred goals and you can't prioritize them, then every goal has 1% of the significance necessary to really move you forward. And so to be maximally motivated, you need to know why you're doing what you're doing all the way up 
Jacob's ladder all the way up. And that brings us to the notion of the macrocosm that's the heavenly hierarchy. And in some sense, it's a psychological macrocosm, although not in all senses, because it brings society into the purview. So here's a, here's a proposition. Any system of priorities is a structure of values. So you may or may not accept the proposition that you have to hierarchically arrange your perceptions. You also, by the way, have to do the same thing on the action front, because if you're inclined to do 10 things at once, you can do none. And consciousness, by the way, is a very narrow channel. And we generally can only concentrate on one thing at a time. And the reason for that in some sense is because we can only act out one thing at a time. And so not only do you have to prioritize your perceptions, which are action-based anyways, you also have to prioritize what you're going to do because you have to do the first thing first and then the second thing and the third thing. And that's obviously a structure of priority. And a structure of priority is a structure of comparative value. And a hierarchical structure of comparative value is an ethic. And so what that means, as far as I can tell, and this is something, if it's true, is that we cannot see the world except through an ethic. And I mean that literally as well as metaphorically. You literally cannot see the world or act in it. You cannot perceive the world except through a structure, a, hierarch a hierarchical structure of value, which is an ethic. And so then I would say, and here's something else to chew on for like 20 years, a story is a verbal description of a hierarchy of perceptual and action prioritization. And the reason that we're so attracted to stories is because it's so difficult to perceive and act in the world that we're hungry at the level of soul for a narrative that represents to us a hierarchical ethos that we could embody as a model for emulation. And so that's what our stories are. They're models, they're ritual models for emulation, most fundamentally. And the anti-hero story, well, that's easy enough to contend with. It's like, watch this person who ends up in catastrophe and hell and do the opposite of whatever it is they're doing. And so that's a powerful lesson because there's something very compelling, as we said before, about very powerful negative emotion. And so uh, even if you don't believe in heaven, you might be able to conjure up a belief in hell. And if you can't, I would say, well, you're either not using your imagination or you're hiding or so far you're just lucky. But I wouldn't expect. And so you can certainly see the catastrophe and even the hellish catastrophe beckoning. And you might think plotting a route that would make that the least likely seems to be a good idea. And so part of the reason that we're fascinated by villains and supervillains for that example, or part of the reason we're fascinated and endlessly so with figures like Lucifer and Satan is because we're attempting to flesh out the nature of the antithesis to the worst kind of hierarchy of values. And that's gripping to us. It's gripping to us. Now, there's more to it as well, because we also will turn our attention to the negative to fortify ourselves against the negative in preparation for confrontation with the negative. And so we can do that through use of fiction. And that's what we're doing, for example, at least in part, when we do such strange things as amuse ourselves with horror films. Partly what we're trying to investigate is like, what's up, what does up mean? What does it mean? Is there such a thing? Now, one thing to remember is that if you don't erect a hierarchical structure with, a, with something to aim at, you got no positive motivation because you experience positive motivation in relationship to a goal, not from attaining the goal. That's satisfaction. And besides, it's fleeting. You know perfectly well. You graduate from university, poof, next day you have a problem, which is what do you do next? And that's a, that's a tough problem. It's not like you've solved your problems by winning that game. You just introduced the problem of having to introduce another game. So it's unreliable as a source of positive emotion, but what's reliable is you set a goal and you try to attain it and then that gives your life that literally provides your life with meaning so there's this idea in Cain and Abel that you have to make sacrifices in order to stay on the good side of God and so I thought about that um, 
practically, say, not so much metaphysically, but practically, and realized that that was equivalent to the discovery of time, of the future. Because we do, we do act, and, it, and this is a peculiar discovery of human beings, maybe a consequence of our expanded intelligence, is that we're actually aware of the future. And we actually treat the future as if it's something that you can bargain with. Now, partly it's because the future is other people, and they remember your reputation, they remember your past actions, and if you do someone a favor, then that favor is in some sense stored up in the future. So you could think about the future as a place of judgment about your moral actions, and it's not that far from that to imagining a god who's keeping track of that, or who even is that, but in any case, the idea of sacrifice emerges in the story of Cain and Abel, and Cain and Abel both make sacrifices to God in, in order to stay on his good side, let's say. And what a sacrifice means is that you give up something of value in the present so that you can be, so that you can improve the future. And you know, that's no different from what we call discipline. It's exactly the same thing. It's just the, the concretely acted out version of that. And so, you know, the idea basically was that, well, God was in the transcendent heavens and and the first question would be well why is that when it's like well if you go out on a really dark night and look up at the sky you have a sense of what's beyond you what what's transcendent what's infinite and and so to associate that with the highest of values is a reasonable association right from from a say from an emotional point of view so it's not particularly primitive it's a smart um, metaphor or it's a smart intuition that, 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 and it's above you and you know we tend to think of when you're moving towards an ideal that you're moving up that you're moving above you're moving to the mountaintop right you're, you're going up not down and so it all sits within that same framework and it's partly because when you go up like on a mountain you can see for long distances right so those, all those things are tangled together so anyways so the idea is that you have to give up something of value now so you so that you make the future better and Sometimes it's even something you love now, and, and that, that's a good example too, because often the things that stop us from moving forward are our attachments to things that we should no longer be attached to, right? And in fact, you can almost make that definitional. If you're not moving forward in your life, there's a high probability that you have some idea or some mode of action or some habit that you're so in love with that you won't let go of it. In the story of, of uh, Adam and Eve, once Adam and Eve are thrown out of the garden because they become prematurely self-conscious and prideful in some real sense, God is presented as the spirit that you walk with when you walk unself-consciously in relationship to the highest in the garden. And that's actually an experiential reference, as you imagine you're having a particularly good day in a particularly beautiful garden, like the day we had today. It's like, are you closer to God? Well, the answer is, experientially, well, yes, because you feel, you feel that your existence is imbued with a deep sense of appropriate significance. And that's not a rational, secondarily derived argument. It's primary. It's a primary experience. And part of what the biblical corpus is trying to do is to lay out the nature of the spirit that inhabits you when you're oriented towards the highest possible good and to point out that that's phenomenological, it's experiential, it's existential, it's embodied. It's not a secondary overlay of the description of the nature of the world on the world. That's not what the biblical corpus is trying to do. So in the story of Cain and Abel, what's God? God is that which calls you to make the appropriate sacrifices and calls you on it when you don't. And try to escape that and see what happens. We know perfectly well, perfectly well, that that's a pathway to hell. And you might say, I don't believe in hell. And I would say, that means you don't know anything. Noah, what's, who is God or what is God in the story of Noah? The spirit that calls the wise to prepare in the face of crisis. Do you abide by that or not? Well, you do if you're wise and you do if you care about the people around you. Abraham, what's God? The spirit that calls the inappropriately luxuriating out to the terrible adventure of their life. And that then requires of them the highest possible sacrifice to obtain the highest possible possible
goal. In Exodus, what's God? The spirit that lays tyranny to waste. The spirit that guides you through the desert of the soul. The spirit that orients you towards the promised land and abuse you with the enthusiasm that allows you to make your way out of the tyranny and through the desert. And each story is part of a circumambulation, a narrative circumambulation that's attempting to represent the union of virtues that could be embodied in perception and action that constitute the pinnacle of the pyramid. And that, by the way, pyramid, that's Mount Sinai. That's the proper hierarchical organization of society. That's the aesthetic model for the construction of the Ark of the Covenant. It's all of that simultaneously. It's the Egyptian pyramid with the gold cap. The question is, what's the cap? What's at the highest? Well, that is the mystery. What should be placed in the highest place? We already said, well, something better be, because if nothing's placed in the highest place, then there's nothing in the highest place. And what's the consequence of that? Well, to return to that theme, anomy, anxiety, overwhelming dread, psychological destabilization, and the absence of joy. And there is no escaping from that except by solving the problem. But it's worse than that because this hierarchy of perceptual prioritization unites us socially. So here we are in a theater, and we've seen many examples of theaters today, including the amphitheater, where it's a concentric circle that focuses everyone's attention on the same spectacle. Well, that's the definition of a culture, is that everyone's attention is focused on the same spectacle. And so the hierarchy of perceptual prioritization and action that unites you psychologically is also the same structure that unites us socially. And so that means the kingdom of God is within and without simultaneously in some most fundamental sense. And you might say, well, we don't need a superordinate ethic to unite us. And I would say, okay, then we're not united. And so what are we if we're not united? And the answer is, well, we're a house divided against itself. And what's the consequence of that? Everyone, that's the Hobbesian nightmare, right? That's not the noble savage, that's the Hobbesian nightmare. It's like, you and I, we cannot play together. We cannot focus our attention on the same point and cooperate and compete amicably, peacefully, productively, and generously towards that point. And that's not nothing. That's the death of God. That's the rise of nihilism. That's the emergence of a corrosive and destabilizing and deep cynicism. And it's the death of joy and enthusiasm. And so we might say, well, what do we have in the absence of God if God is the spirit that animates us to action and perception in relationship to the highest good? And the answer is, we have the catastrophe of the death of God that Nietzsche referred to when he announced the death of God and said simultaneously that we were the murderer of all murderers and that we would never find the water to wash away the blood. And that is definitely the situation we're in now. And, and hopefully, hopefully, we'll all wake up enough at the individual level to play out that catastrophe of valuelessness within our own souls and render the judgment that's necessary upon each of us in ourselves by our own voluntary assent or we'll act out the failure to do that in the external world. And that's the decision, as far as I can tell, that in some real sense, and maybe in a sense that's more real than ever before in the entire history of the world, even though this battle has been playing out eternally, that's the choice that confronts us now. Wake up. We have a moral burden to bear, and that's the adventure of our life. That's the other thing so interesting about the Abrahamic story is that God calls Abraham out of his luxurious slumber and sends him into a catastrophe. Tyranny, starvation, war, brutal. But he has the adventure of his life. You might say, well, the, it's the adventure of your life that justifies the catastrophe of your life. It's not some simple-minded, juvenile hedonism or desire for comfort. That's not what we're built for.
We're built for the adventure of our lives. And where do you find that? You find that in orienting yourself to the highest possible good in all ways and speaking the truth forthrightly along that pathway. The fact that certain things bother you and you might think I wish nothing bothered me it's like no you don't really you know because if you nothing bothered you in some sense that would be the same thing as not caring about anything it actually turns out to be the case that the things that bug you are the things that you care about when they go wrong and so then this is a really useful question to ask yourself you know because you might be observing the political landscape and you think that really bugs me and maybe you annoy the hell out of your friends and your enemies and even yourself by, you know, being obsessively concerned about that thing that bugs you. And then you might ask yourself, well, why does that bug you? Because there's like a million things that could in principle bother you. And, you know, maybe, maybe you're one of those people that has a million things bother you, but probably not. There's more things that don't bother you than that do bother you. Because there's a lot of things. And if everything bothered you, you just die. Right, so, so there's very selective things that bother you and it's very interesting because in some sense they choose you because you might say something like I wish that didn't bother me it's like that's a very strange thing to say because it begs the question why then does that bother you and also why can't you control it right that's a very very this is part of the reason I loved reading the psychoanalysts because the psychoanalysts knew they're the first people who really cottoned on to this in a kind of technically sophisticated manner. They knew that we were in part collections of autonomous sub-personalities and that those sub-personalities could take control of us. And that's really what happens when something bugs you. It's something autonomous that has a will and an agency takes control of you and, and, and forces you to attend despite yourself sometimes and uh, why should you attend because that's the, your destiny calling you right that's your problem and that's a good thing to know because people ask themselves where do I find the meaning in in my life I say well are there things that bother you say, yes those are your problems and you might say, well, I don't want those to be my problems. Like, hey, did someone ask you? It's just how it happens. And so then, why is that relevant to writing? Why don't you write about something that bothers you? And try to figure it out. Because you've got to ask yourself, well, first of all, what would your life be like if you actually addressed the things that bothered you? Right? And say, well, political things bother me. It's like, maybe you have a political duty that's calling to you. I mean, why not? Someone has to, and you're a citizen. Could be you, and not, and, and not just an interest, right? And not just an obsession, but an obligation and a responsibility. And God only knows what would happen if you pursued that. I was talking to Mike Johnson, who's, who's the fourth most re powerful Republican in, uh, in, in Washington. About, a, about three days ago, we were talking about the potential for young people to be involved in the political sphere. And in our culture, appallingly, most youth involvement comes in the form of protest. And that's the fault of the idiot universities, as far as I can tell. Because basically what students are taught is that if something bothers them, which it might, then they should protest about it. It's like, well, you, you could do something about it instead instead of complaining about the people who are doing something and Moses hid his face for he was afraid to look upon God I read in Jung years ago this idea that I found extraordinarily compelling and useful which was that every ideal is simultaneously and necessarily a judge. And so you imagine that the ideal is something that beckons to you, but you're also, you also pale in comparison to the ideal. And so 
By apprehending an ideal, you're also simultaneously judged, and the higher the ideal, the more intense the judgment in some real sense. I think that's partly why people are terrified of great art, like Michelangelo's David. I read a great commentary on that. The commentator suggested that the statue calls upon you to be far more than you are. So there's that judgment, and I think part of what happens to Moses here is that he's afraid to look upon God, the God of Abraham that calls people to adventure, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God that calls people to adventure and sacrifice and, and then out of slavery as well, is that ideal that's ultimately terrifying in some real sense. And so Moses hides his face for he was afraid to look upon God. Moses' reaction to, what, to God's call is also one of attention. You know, he says, here am I, here I am. That's all he can do. He can just, I'm, I'm here and I'm paying attention to what is happening. And this phrase is so important that it's repeated in other places in the Bible. You see it in the story of Samuel, for example, who has that same reaction. He hears the call and all he can say is, I am here and I am attending now. And so, so, so it's interesting to see that this, this idea of attention continues mm -hmm. on in the story well. As well. It's, 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 this idea of attention is extremely important because it's easy to think of attention and cognition, let's say, or even rationality as somehow equivalent, but they're importantly different because rationality builds towers of Babel, let's say, and rationality makes presumptions about the world, but attention is a precondition for revelation and for rationality, and attention in, is in and of itself a kind of openness to the horizon of transformation, and the more, I would say, there's a direct connection between being attentive and even being capable of healing in some real sense. So if you're a clinician, one of the things you learn, and Carl Rogers, the clinician, was a particularly potent writer on this notion that attentive listening in and of itself has a curative capacity. You let people unfold in front of you, you encourage them to unfold in front of you. And that's not even analytic thought. There can be a strategic component of it, but mostly it's, it's just the devotion of attention. And attention also, in some real sense, sheds light on the darkness because we only see what we attend to. And what we don't see or what we don't perceive in the broadest sense is in some real sense, not even there. Here's something that's really worth considering given what we've been discussing. So imagine you cast a vision onto the unknown to, to pull yourself forward in faith. Okay, so then the question is, where does the vision come from if it's a proper vision? And I would say the answer to that, neurologically and psychologically, is that it comes from the proper interplay between chaos and order. It, it really does do that because the order is what you already know and the chaos is what's yet to be learned, right? And there's a meaningful conjunction of those two. And I, I say meaningful because when those two are conjoined, that's when you get the experience of meaning, like you do when you listen to music, because it's partly predictable and partly unpredictable. And in a conversation that's compelling, it refers to what you know because you can't understand it, but it refers to what you don't know because it wouldn't be interesting. And when those are optimized, then this spirit of meaning that's pulling you forward and where what the spirit of meaning manifests itself in, in its initial phases from the Jungian perspective is a vision of the potential future. When I explain to the audiences, and this is especially true, it seems to be especially true of, of men, of young men, but not so young even, to say, look, you, you, have, you, you have an ethical obligation to lift the heaviest load you can possibly conceive of and that's the primary call to adventure in life and that call to adventure is mm. so worthwhile yes. that it justifies the particularity everybody it's like lights go on yes. they think oh yes. i see so you need a meaning to set against the suffering and to protect you against that temptation towards malevolence you need that well where's the meaning to be found well it's not happiness it's not short-term pleasure. It's not, it's not self-development. It's not self-esteem. It's none of those things that are so focused on, on, on the individual psyche even. Yeah. It's, it's literally the stumbling yes. uphill towards yes. the city of yes. God yes. with your burden. Yes. People go, yes. well, that's where the meaning is? And they know that because they know responsible people. They know they admire responsible people. They, they already got that. Say, well, that's what you should become. And they think, and not only that, that that's what you could become because that's what you are in the deepest yes. sense. Yes.
in the story of Adam and Eve, God is not least. And this is a God as character or God as model for ritual emulation or God as yeah, God as central narrative figure. That's another way of thinking about it. God is the spirit that you walk with when you're not self-conscious in a well-tended garden. Okay, so why do you have a garden? It's precisely so you can do that. To forget about yourself for a minute, to engage in the apprehension of something balanced and beautiful, a walled garden, the proper, the proper integration of culture and nature. And the proper apprehension in that situation frees you of your self-conscious burden. And so for a moment you enter that transcendent state that's associated with the Edenic paradise. So that's God in that story. Later in the story of Adam and Eve, God is the spirit that calls you to conscience when, like Adam and Eve, you've bitten off more than you can chew. In the story of Cain and Abel, God is the spirit of conscience that calls to you when you've made improper sacrifices and are facing the consequence of your unwillingness to go all in on your life. In the story of Noah, God is the spirit that calls to you if you're wise, when trouble is coming and you determine to batten down the hatches. In the story of Abraham, God is the spirit that call, calls the overprotected and unwilling despite their resistance out into the adventure of their life. In the story of Moses, God is the spirit that calls to those who are oppressed and in slavery to free themselves from the grip of tyranny, whether it's their psychological tyranny or whether it's the tyranny of the state. And so all of those stories point to an underlying transcendent unity of character, let's say, which is the proper model for worship and celebration and ritual emulation that's united, that's the antithesis to the let's say, darker and more multiplicitous spirits that might rule the world. And part of the religious enterprise is the, is the elaboration and understanding and then the incorporation, ingestion, and modeling of that spirit in your own life. And to the degree that you do that, you do what the Logos did at the beginning of time in Genesis. You use truth truthful speech guided let's say by love to confront the transforming horizon of the future the chaos and potential of the transforming potential transforming horizon of the future and turn it into the habitable order that is good and that's a manifestation of the image of god that men and women are made in there's a sacrificial element in maturation Right? You have to sacrifice the pluripotentiality of childhood for the actuality of a frame. And the question is, well, why would you do that? Well, one reason is, it happens to you whether you do it or not. You can either choose your damn limitation, or you can let it take you unaware when you're 30, or even worse, when you're 40. And then, that is not a happy day. You see, I see people like this, and I think it's more and more common in our culture because people can put off mat maturity without suffering an immediate penalty. But all that happens is the penalty accrues, and then when it finally hits, it just wallops you. Because when you're 25, you can be an idiot. It's no problem. Even when you're out in a job search, it's like, well, you don't have any experience and you're kind of clueless. It's, yeah, yeah, you're young. You know, it's no problem. We can, that's what young people are like, but they're full of potential. Okay, well, now you're the same person at 30. It's like people aren't so thrilled about you at that point. It's like, what the hell have you been doing for the last 10 years? Well, I'm just as clueless as I was when I was 22. It's, yeah, but you're not 22. You're an old infant, right? And that's an ugly thing, an old infant. So, the, the re part of the reason you choose your damn sacrifice, because the sacrifice is inevitable but at least you get to choose it. And then there's something that's, that's even more complex than that in some sense, is that the problem with being a child is that all you are is potential, and it's really low resolution. You could be anything, but you're not anything. So then you go and you adopt an apprenticeship, roughly speaking, and then you become, at least you become something. And when you're something, that makes the world open up to you again. You know, like if you're a really good plumber, then you end up being far more than a plumber, right? You end up being a good employer. Not, not that plumbers, I'm not putting plumbers down. It's like more power to plumbers. 
They've saved more lives than doctors. So, hygiene, right? So, you know, if you're a really good plumber, well then you have some employees, you run a business, you, 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 make, you, you train some other people, you enlarge their lives, you're kind of a pillar of the community, you, you have your family. It's, you can, once you pass through that narrow training period, which narrows you and constricts you and develops you at the same time, then you can come out the other end with a bunch of new possibility at, hell, at hand. And Jung talked about that. He thought that the proper part of the proper path of development in the last half of life was to rediscover the child that you left behind as you were apprenticing. And so then you get to be something and regain that potential at the same time. Very, very smart. Well, he was very, very smart. So that's very wise. Responsibility in some sense, that's maturity, but I would also say that's the adventure of your life. And how is that tied to the idea of sacrifice? Well, what do you have to sacrifice if you're responsible? And the answer is you have to sacrifice your short-term hedonic and immature whims, right? So if you're a child, if you're two, you're impulsive, and that means that you only act for the moment, and you only act in relationship to what it is that you, as a singular individual, want in that moment. And that's just not a tenable solution to the complexities of life because you don't just exist in a moment you exist as an iterated set of identities across time you yourself are a community that extends across time and you have to govern every action that you take in the present in relationship to the fact that you can do what you want tonight man but you got to put up with yourself tomorrow morning and you got to put up with yourself for what you did tonight, next week, and next year, and five years from now. And every single one of your actions is like that. And so, in order to act properly, you have to sacrifice the impulsive gratification and the easy way out that's characteristic of the moment, and extend yourself across time so that you are acting in concert with the highest interest of yourself in the broadest possible range of context. And that's what it means to be an adult. And you do exactly the same thing with other people in a relationship, in a marriage. You're not just who you say you are from moment to moment. You have to negotiate very carefully with your wife or with your husband on an ongoing basis every week, every moment in some sense while you're communicating to understand not only how you can get what you need and you want, which may be necessary and and, and, and important, especially in the long run, because you have to treat yourself properly, but so that you can do that in a way that your partner can also get what he or she needs and wants in a way that makes both of you more likely to get what you need and want over the long span and more so than you would get if you were alone. And if it wasn't the case, why would you bother with it? And then you have to incorporate children into that too, and that gets to be a more complex unity. So if there's five of you, well, how do you balance your individual needs and wants with, the co with that small collective? And that's the negotiation process that goes on in a family, and hopefully you do that too in the spirit of reciprocity and truth and love. And you take on that responsibility, and that's the core aspect of sacrifice, right? The, the great discovery of the human race. That's what sacrifice means. And you make, you sacrifice the foolishness of yourself. You sacrifice the momentary foolishness of yourself to the highest good that you can possibly imagine. And there's nothing in that that isn't good, even though it's difficult. And so, and that's not mere inhibition of those impulsive gratifications that if only were allowed to be manifest fully would set you free. Quite the contrary, you would have precisely the freedom of an extremely badly behaved two-year-old. And that's no freedom at all, right? All that is is freedom to wander in the street and get crushed by the first car that drives by. And there's nothing in that that's proper.